Hello everyone, I'm going to be writing a essay, the second prompt essay on allegations of abuses of executive power. Um, and uh, please bear with me. Obviously, I don't want to disturb other kids in the room, so I'm going to try to whisper. Um, I'm also going to try to, um, uh, you also have to consider that this is going to be the second essay of four that I need to write. Um, I'm planning on writing a couple of AP European history essays and then probably one more AP government essay, so maybe four or five essays. Um, and so I'm a little tired too, because I did um, write previously the essay on judicial review. And so if you want to do that topic instead, then this is the wrong video for you and look for um, that essay topic. But this one is going to be about allegations of abuse of executive power, which is very similar to the essay that you wrote. Or not very similar, it's very kind of, uh, can cover some of the same th themes and, and incorporate some of the same evidence in the um, abuse of power, um, or I'm sorry, the authoritarianism essay you wrote in unit two, um, which kind of centered on the executive branch of government specifically. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this. First, I will say, um, I will ask that you read. Um, so, um, if you want to do this essay, I'll provide you with extra resources. You have several different choices. You can either watch or read from again. You can read the article on uh, the Bush administration's um, torture policies. Um, you could read the article on the Obama administration's um, um, you know, expansive assertion of executive power to conduct um, uh, uh, political assassinations, or, or not political assassinations, but to conduct uh, drone strikes overseas, all are which have um, um, been derided by critics as obvious abuses of, or not obvious, but abuses of executive power. Um, you can also read an excerpt that I included um, from After Trump, which is a book by Bob Bauer, and Jack Goldsmith. I included like just the preface. Um, although it's kind of like a sensational title, title after Trump, and it looks like something you might find in like the crazy political book section in Barnes and Noble. Um, you often have to know too that um, even sometimes more academic books or more sophisticated readings have kind of these sorts of titles um, themselves. What's up, my friend? Good morning, good morning. Um, so we can read this um, aspect, um, all that good stuff. Or, so you can read this, and this actually doesn't just talk about Trump, it talks about um, sort of, and it has my annotations in here, it also talks about um, you know, the accretion of, of power in the executive under the Obama and the Bush administration and sort of the uh, areas in which a critic might interpret an, an abuse of power. Okay. So having said that, we see right here allegations of abuse of executive power has been commonplace feature of 21st century politics. What trends in politics have enabled, in your view, increasing and controversial assertions of executive power? Um, so what we mean by this specifically, what has enabled the executive branch to claim more and more power over time, right? And we're kind of trying to link it based on the 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 um, 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 the prompt with kind of abuses of executive power or maybe what we interpret as uh, non-fidelity to the original intention of the Constitution or maybe just too much power in the hands of the executive branch of government. Then it also asks you to describe which constitutional safeguards have proven ineffective at stopping the accretion of power in the executive. I should also say that you can also go back to the article that we read um, and read that as well. Fromm talks about and integrates a lot of these pieces of evidence. He famously talks about Federalist 51, which is like the checks and balances uh, Federalist paper and all that good stuff as well. So the next thing too, I'm gonna to try to integrate more evidence or describe all these pieces of evidence so you can be more successful on your essay, but you only have to choose four pieces of evidence. So specifically for Brutus number one, remember the context behind Brutus number one, and remember that you can also have a reference sheet um, here that will tell you like the specific aspects of Brutus number one. 
But the context specifically behind British number one was that the constitution had just been proposed without a bill of rights. And there was a lot of people, anti-federalists specifically, that were not content with um, the constitution. And they had some reservations about the then proposed constitution uh, designed to replace the ineffective Articles of Confederation. And specifically, anti-federalists were worried about the power vested in the in a unitary executive or a single executive. Um, in British number one, anti-federalists are often seen as being proponents of um, um, of having a a kind of council in the executive. Um, so they were worried about the power vested in a unitary executive or a single executive. They were also worried about the power delegated to the federal government and worried about a lack of a Bill of Rights. Federalist 10 kind of responds to that. Um, and re remember, they said that tyranny is possible under these conditions. Federalist 10 kind of responds to British number one. And famously, Madison says that a, um, oh, also in British number one, it says, how can a large republic possibly adjust? How can a large republic possibly address the interests needs and wants of society. And I'm paraphrasing a bit. Federalist number 10, uh, Madison responds to this and says that actually a strong federal government um, and a large republic specifically is less beholden to tyranny because you'll have several different competing factions that in a smaller republic would be able to capture the government or um, maybe to influence politics significantly. So basically says that in a large republic, you would have more interests, more people with uh, different conceptions and, uh, or of rights and, and, and morality that would align with different groups. And he, he kind of, Madison kind of emphasizes the importance of pluralist democracy. British number one, emphasizing that a more participatory democracy um, is supreme. That's kind of like the value statement behind these, these sort of pieces of evidence. And then I'll, obviously you're not going to integrate and describe all of that in your essay. You kind of want to run with the same sort of thread. And there's different ways in which you can approach this essay. You can talk about um, the um, uh, assertions of, of uh, war powers in, in, in the Constitution. Or you can talk about how the executive has increasingly shrugged um, sort of restrictions um, on the executive's ability to conduct um, war and engage in, in conflicts overseas. Federalist 51 is famously ambition is made to counteract ambition. Federalist 70 is a very interesting document. So in Federalist 70 specifically, um, and I'll go to the quote, Federal 70 argues for the importance of a unitary executive or a single executive as opposed to other uh, sort of executives, or I'm sorry, as opposed to a council of executives. And it says there's an idea which is not without its advocates that a vigorous, strong executive is inconsistent with the genius of Republican government. The enlightened well wishers to this species of government must at least hope that the supposition assumption is destitute of foundation since they can never admit its truth without at the same time admitting the condemnation of their own principle. Energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of community against foreign attacks. It is no less 
not less essential than the steady administration of laws to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary courses of justice, the security of liberty against enterprises and insults of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. There can be no need, however, to multiply arguments or examples on his head. A feeble, weak executive implies a feeble execution of government. A feeble executive is about another phrase for a bad execution. So Federalist 70 is often used, and we had talked about this, and this may be used if you're um, kind of more favorable to, you know, increasing uh, the power of the executive. Um, but we've talked about, I think, John, you, Federalist. or in previous video. Um, so John Yu was um, a famous uh, Justice Department lawyer. Now he's a law professor at the University of Berkeley. He had wrote the infamous torture memos um, that we had talked about earlier uh, that had said that uh, during times of war, the president's inherent and emergency powers are such that statutes um, restricting the president um, in terms of the type of interrogation were uh, unconstitutional. So he, you know, John Yu famously, you know, advocated for increasing power in the executive or um, his um, legal opinion suggested that there was quite a bit of power um, that the executive could tap into uh, based on uh, case law and all that sorts of stuff. Um, ironically, in this article, John Yu uh, uh, argues that executive power run amok um, which is kind of one of those things that you can interpret as a, a pretty hefty critique of President Trump in the sense that if John Yu is saying it, you're like the executive branch, um, the powers of the executive branch are running amok, uh, then maybe, whoa, you need to take a step back there. To the same token, you can also interpret it um, and kind of discredit um, an op-ed written by John Yu in the sense that um, is this dude really... Um, should he be accepted back into polite society, all that sorts of stuff. But what? But he kind of cites Federalist 70, um, and oftentimes people that are uh, making arguments in today's opinion pages about the importance of a power in the executive oftentimes cite Federalist 70. Um, to uh, their credit, Bob Bauer and Jack Goldsmith, um, one, Bob Bauer was a, a senior Justice Department official in the, in the Obama administration. Jack Goldsmith was a senior Justice Department official in the Bush administration, now a Harvard law professor. I think Bob Bauer might also be a Harvard law professor. And they also say, too, you know, that the idea behind Federal 70 that of um, a strong executive is important. And so in a lot of reforms that they propose, they don't want to necessarily kind of hinder the executive's ability to um, their reforms are, are carefully tailored, I should say, to avoid uh, the ability of the executive to be ineffectual in a time of, of crisis, but nonetheless reforms that they feel are needed. So it's an interesting book. I can put a link in the description to the podcast uh, or a podcast or I'm sure there's got to be a podcast to them talking about that book, probably through Lawfare because it is a Lawfare press book. OK. So having said that, we know that Federal 70 advocates for, you know, a vigorous executive, an energetic executive, um, and it's often used by people that have historically made um, or or have described the executive uh, branch as having broad powers or have helped the executive branch assert broad powers, it has often been cited by those types of people. Here's my essay. Article two, um, by this we mean Article two of the Constitution specifically. And so you could come here and you can see Article two of the Constitution. 
specifically in Article 2 of the Constitution, Constitution, you can talk about many things. But I think one specific aspect of Article 2 of the Constitution is really important, which is specifically that it says that the president shall be commander in chief. So in Section 2, president is uh, the commander in chief of the armed forces. This, um, over time, the president has increasingly been able to uh, deploy military forces um, and oftentimes in um, um, either through congressional acquiescence or congressional unwillingness to confront or or through uh, alleged, um, you know, executive opinions and, and, and um, assertions of executive power um, has done that uh, without, um, you know, the approval of the legislative branch. Which is interesting because. Every time it says include evidence from like this article two of the executive branch, you can really be very, um, you know, choose, you know, whatever it is you want to run with. The War Powers Act is really an interesting bit. In 1973, Congress, um, in an attempt to kind of rein in uh, the executive's, um, you know, perceived executive abuses, specifically in um, deploying forces in the Vietnam War, um, deploying forces in Cambodia. Uh, the 19, Congress passed the 1973 War Powers Resolution, and the resolution requires the president to cease unilateral, meaning um, only by himself, military action against after 60 days. And so the interesting thing about the War Powers Resolution is it seems like a powerful ability for or a a kind of hallmark piece of or a, a kind of important piece of legislation that allows um, the commander or I'm sorry, that is really seen as kind of like this assertion of war powers um, or, or, or an attempt by the legislature to reclaim some of the war powers that um, and, and kind of eat into um, you know, years and decades of of executive gradual accretion of of war powers, um, but it has largely been ineffectual. Um, there have been presidents that have flat out, you know, kind of interpreted, um, you know, the language of the war powers resolution as kind of a sort of authorization to use military force as long as it doesn't last past 60 days. Um, there have been presidents that have flat out just disrespected the war powers resolution. Um, we can talk about like the Libyan intervention, uh, which was done with uh, or was conducted in the absence of a war powers resolution. Um, or I'm sorry, with the, it, which was, um, you know, kind of ignored the 60 day mark. Um, I think it was Libya, right? Look at that. In intervention, war powers. Yeah, so you can see right here a classic case, which I can include um, a President Obama flaunting the war powers resolution. What's up? Yeah, I'm recording. I'm trying to record your essay so that way you have something to base it on. I'm trying to do it quietly too, so I don't disturb you. Jose, you actually won a core value award, but you weren't here. Uh, won the what? You won a core value award. For real? Yes. For what? Team and family. Oh, 
There you go. I recorded it. Yes, I added you in the senior master class. I'll show you later. Necessary war powers of the resolution requires the president to cease unilateral military actions up to six days in any situation where U.S. forces engage hostilities. Um, but then this has obviously been, or has not necessarily obviously, but has been flaunted. Um, there's also political dynamics to this in the sense that um, there's this thing called a rally around the flag effect, um, where a lot of Americans maybe perceive, um, you know, congressional attempts to rein in presidential conduct um, in foreign affairs and military affairs and, and rein in presidential conduct um, in terms of um, engaging hostilities against perceived, you know, bad guys overseas as um, uh, as as unnecessary dissent. Um, they get angry about it sometimes, um, and um, and so we we've seen a lot of um, there's a lot of political capital um, that the president has because he has the bully bully pulpit and informal powers, um, and and people really don't like. Um, you know, maybe congressmen making a fuss about uh, legal uh, requirements and, and constitutional, um, um, uh, you know, powers and, and war powers um, in perceived times in which um, the executive is, is, you know, undertaking and fighting perceived enemies, right? Um, so there's some political costs that congressmen could face and, and kind of oftentimes, you know, um, don't really want to bring up this this um, arena or this or want to be critical of the accretion it seems of, of of war powers in the hands of the executive but also too there's a political desire to also just um, allow the executive to be seen as the chief um, sort of uh, military officer to engage in military affairs overseas uh, the 2003 Iraq war for instance there was a lot of Congressmen, um, uh, Congress people that had um, voted to authorize the war in 2003 that paid um, significant political costs when the war did not go well. And so one example would be Hillary Clinton, um, who paid significant political costs in 2008 when she ran, or 2007 when she ran in the primaries against Barack Obama, who voted against the war. Uh, but because the war was not going well, um, that probably, you know, was one of the principal reasons of many uh, in which she was um, denied the ability to want to win the 2007 uh, Democratic nomination. So there's now maybe a political incentive for uh, Congress people to kind of um, allow the president to uh, assert a certain types of war powers um, and which kind of uh, breaks down uh, maybe the vision of the founders. But Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1 of the Constitution deals with the power of the purse. I wanted to show you on Avalon. And then one of the specific enumerated powers of Congress. So this is Article One. Remember, Article One is the enumerated. It describes the powers um, allocated to Congress. Is to right here declare war, grant letters of marque. But the power to declare war is granted to Congress. Um, but as we've discussed, um, since the president has kind of asserted through case law that they have uh, wide discretion in um, deploying troops. Um, there's a lot of different factors that has contributed this. And so one of the things is like, um, this was confirmed in early case law in the 19th century, that the president had a sort of ability to, um, you know, repel 
um, sudden attacks. And then we talked about this principle of stare decisis. And then through case law, the president gradually accrued more and more power and the uh, widely recognized um, executive authority for the president to uh, repel sudden attacks morphed into this uh, executive authority to repel, uh, or I'm sorry, to, um, uh, um, um, to marshal the military um, in instances of self-defense. Um, and then this came to become a more expansive view of the executive power, specifically in the global war on terror. And we discussed this kind of development where um, self-defense kind of gives way and famously articulated in the 2002 national security strategy by the Bush administration, but that's another story, uh, kind of gives way to anticipatory self-defense and a lot of executive branch lawyers and specifically in the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department are arguing that the president has um, the power to um, deploy forces in anticipatory self-defense, meaning not in the not in the sense of a of a, a direct attack, but in anticipation of maybe a um, threat um, in the future. So maybe a against a, a nuclear weapons program or against um, or the arguments being advanced were that the executive didn't need congressional authorization to commit uh, troops um, to um, stave off terrorist attacks or um, um, you know weapons of mass destruction attacks and stuff like that. So a more expansive view of presidential war powers that is further facilitated by the global war on terror, which we spent a great deal of this class trying to understand and wrestle with. <laughs> The last concept here is political polarization, which goes into like the idea that we're coming further apart politically at both representatives, which is probably more important, and public. Less and less in common. And then this kind of really gets discussed a lot in the from article that we read where um, same party Congresses tend to overlook the deficiencies of the president. Same party Congress people tend to overlook deficiencies or perceive abuses of a same party president. We had discussed how like the enhanced interrogation program doesn't really get investigated. Um, Democrats sweep into office, um, how um, same party Congress people tend to overlook increasing assertions of executive power that are perceived by uh, opposing parties as, um, you know, abuses of executive power or um, a disconcerting um, um, a sort of accumulation of executive power. I don't know why I say accretion, but accumulation of executive power um, that may, um, you know, uh, lend itself to abuse further down the line. Um, uh, same party congressmen um, tend to be uh, more immune or, or, or sort of ignore those types of criticisms, but then when they're in the opposition party, they definitely do try to capitalize on uh, and, and engage in those types of critiques. So making the reform agenda a bit more difficult. So that was a lot of explanation of the different pieces of evidence that we have. And so now I'm going to write the essay. So it asks, what trends in politics have enabled, in your view, increasing and controversial assertions of executive power? Oh, are you going to explain? No. Why? Well, I think you shut down. Maybe you won't. Maybe not. No, what's going to happen? Oh, you have to see you. You're the ambulance of course. No, you can't. No, maybe you shut down. Oh, we're transitioning? Yeah. So 
As far as trends in politics, there are several different trends you could identify that have led to the sort of accumulation of executive power. Or accumulation of powers in the executive. So you can talk about expanding federal government. You can also talk about more political polarization. And now there's, um, in theory, under Article 2, you can also talk about like um, informal powers of the president, like executive agreements or executive privilege, all sorts of stuff like that. But political polarization is another thing that you could talk about. Um, and oftentimes now it's seen as, um, especially in the polarized politics that we have too, which often yields divided governments, um, like the one that we're likely to see in 2020, uh, assuming Republicans hold on to the Senate, where uh, President-elect Biden is likely going to have to institute pol policies through executive agreements, I'm not sorry, not through executive agreements, but through executive actions, leaving open in 2024 if a Republican wins the presidency to just rescind those executive actions because they're not law. They're a more precarious sort of form of, of quasi-law for the purposes of this class. And also to think about um, um, a range of different informal powers um, that have developed over time um, where presidents now engage executive agreements, which are basically like treaties that aren't ratified. But again, the downside is that all it takes is an opposing party um, um, executive to rescind or renege on the promises in an executive agreement. Um, a treaty is something that needs to be ratified. Um, so there's increasing political polarization and you can go that direction and then talk about how the executive is now seen as the main policy mechanism by which um, parties try to enact their partisan conception of the national interest. So you can talk about that. You can also talk about war powers specifically, and you can talk about how like, um, there has been like kind of this proliferation of this belief that the executive needs more in expanding war powers um, to engage in anticipatory self-defense against um, attacks. Specifically, this is sort of the language of the 2002 National Security Strategy articulated by President Bush, but against attacks that come from terrorists, um, against, um, you know, um, you know, anticipating attacks that might arise from a uh, nuclear capable capable regime that is not yet nuclear capable now, um, sort of that language. Um, also, the fact that the United States has become has gained such an outside role in managing um, um, international politics. It's often seen as the policeman in the role. You can talk about that trend specifically. I'm going to kind of focus on this trend on war on the political polarization trend and maybe a bit on expanding government uh, roles, specifically expanding uh, the military, um, you know, the development of standing army and stuff like that, and the fact that um, the Constitution delimited powers in a world um, and in, for a country that was significantly smaller, had a significantly um, smaller federal government than it does today. So I'm going to say my thesis statement will be like political polarization and increasing A perceived, I should say, 
a world of we can just use the language of the Bush administration. Political polarization and for more deliberate and fast movement. led to the accumulation of power in the executive. You also want to address um, I proved ineffective at stopping the accretion of power in the executive. You also want to address specifically Political polarization and perceived greater need for fast moving action and world weapons mass destruction of terrorist groups has led to the accumulation of power in the executive. You also want to discuss like what constitutional safeguards have proven ineffective of stopping this accumulation of power in the executive. And specifically, you can talk about constitutional in its ability to rein in the president because of these trends. Political polarization and perceived greater need for fast moving action in a world of weapons of mass destruction and terrorist groups has led to the accumulation of power in the executive. Congress has failed in its ability to rein in the president because of these trends. And Congress, for political reasons, and you'll specify the political reasons, has enabled the accumulation in the executive. Okay, so that's an interesting thesis, and it's almost like two sort of thesis statements, right? And we talked about this before, right? In a lot of the prompts in college, you're going to be asked multiple questions, and so effectively you're creating two thesis statements. But at the core, we have a claim, and we have a because, we have a claim and because, and now we're just looking to integrate the evidence to support these things. So specifically, let's talk about political polarization first. Uh, we can kind of borrow from the from argument if you want to cite a line from from in particular. I'll show you how to cite a line from from in class. You could put from says blank and then a specific reference um, and then the page number. And I'll show you how to put um, a work cited, but we don't have to do that because we had talked about political polarization in class. Specifically, I want you to talk mm. about political polarization in the context of political polarization has What drives political polarization. We talked at length about like populism and how like efforts to democratize political parties um, itself um, have kind of contributed to, um, um, you know, uh, more extremist elements in, in, in thank you, in um, politics gaining steam and political power and running for office. But specifically, political polarization has been a greater As force, we should say, the executive to claim powers in a world little ideological uh, between the parties 
means that a Congress controlled by So specifically, you're saying political polarization has forced the executive mm -hmm. to claim powers in a world where political ideological overlap between the parties means that a Congress controlled by an opposition party can stymie the policy agenda of the president. There are economic, social, and political forces at play that has contributed to political polarization in our society. We talked specifically about some of the electoral elements and the fact that political parties have become more democratized before the party elites used to choose who ran those political parties and they tried to pick someone um, um, that you know was more towards the middle given our two-party system you can go into length about that and i would be really impressed by that and i'll include links in the description that talks about that but now we live in a world where fundamentally um, 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 since the primary processes are democratized we're getting um, you know the parties policy agendas that are drifting further to the left and further to the right um, 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 because the people that turn out for primaries are usually people that are the most uh, left wing or right wing voters. Um, and, you know, maybe you're that left wing or right wing voter and maybe you're on the right side of history. But independent of that, in terms of creating a governing coalition and a policy agenda that would be most uh, that would actually, you know, get enacted into into law, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult when you have more uh, the extremes that are gaining more and more footholds in those political parties. But independent of that, you don't have to explain the backstory behind political polarization. There's other elements as well. There's economic and social elements as well that are contributing to political polarization in our society. But I just emphasize the electoral elements. Um, but you also want to talk about specifically the president has been forced to assert and rely upon informal powers such as executive and executive agreements to enact policies. Here's where you might want to define what an executive order is, or you might want to give it uh, an example, specifically, the president has been forced to assert and rely upon powers such as executive action, executive agreement to enact policies in a world where the opposition party controls one of the houses, one of the chambers in Congress, so either the Senate or the House of Representatives. You could talk about, um, for example, and we had talked about this, President Obama issued executive orders that forced the EPA to comply with carbon reducing targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. Remember, it's an agreement, not a treaty, because um, actually just for our country, because um, it was unlikely that it would get ratified in the Senate. For example, President Obama issued executive orders that forced the EPA to comply with carbon reducing targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. Executive orders although having the force of law and be undone by an opposition party candidate that acquires the presidency. Sorry, excuse the writing, it's very bad, but I'm also very tired. This is a lot to think about and a lot to explain. And for example, President Obama issues executive orders that force the EPA to comply with carbon uh, reducing targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. Executive orders, although having the force of law, can be undone by an opposition party candidate that acquires the presidency. And so, for example, President Trump's executive orders 
are a lot of them, um, you know, enacting his policies, specifically his immigration policies, uh, for example, will likely be undone by the stroke of a pen uh, once President-elect Biden um, takes office. And although President-elect Biden did win um, by around 4.5 percentage points, might be as high, or I think 4.5 percentage points, um, the election, he's still probably going to have a Senate that is controlled by Republicans, and therefore he's going to probably try to, you know, uh, look towards, you know, executive action to enact his policy agenda, um, look towards mm -hmm. executive agreements in term, terms of advancing foreign relationships, in, in terms of advancing his vision of what foreign relations should, should uh, how, how they should be conducted, um, as opposed to um, passing laws and treaties. Because of course they're so polarized. But we also want to talk about, so this is one piece of evidence, and then I explain at length. Um, so remember, you're using the strategy of name, explain, or I'm sorry, name, describe the piece of evidence, and then explain. I didn't do a good job of describing what political polarization is. It's kind of inferred, um, but you kind of want to define it as well. I'll just define it here. The parties mean further apart ideologically. There was a lot of overlap in between political parties once, and there was some form of compromise that I think a lot of your parents are nostalgic for and no longer exists or seems to no longer exist. Uh, but then I explain, you know, and I even give it a, a sort of example um, at length. So I'll put in yellow the explanation in blue I'll put the description. So the description can be very short. The explanation is usually more convoluted. The explanation really requires you to explain mm -hmm. how political polarization, um, you know, supports this part of the thesis and it supports thesis one. Other pieces of evidence I might use is like the war on terror and, you know, different types of threats, uh, non-traditional threats that exist in the world today, um, kind of borrowing a lot of the language of the national security strategy, President Bush's. I know we didn't go over the President Bush's national security strategy. And then let me see what I can talk about. I'll talk about Article 2 or the War Powers Act. I can talk about different measures and then also Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. So I'll put although, so kind of using the yet statements and while statements and uh, that um, Mrs. Smith has taught you to kind of bake in a counter argument and then dismiss that counter argument. Although the Constitution designates gives Congress the ability to declare war, The executive branch of government has historically has gradually expanded its powers over foreign and military affairs because of the both political reasons and the dynamics of the threat environment that exist in a world where the United States is the most powerful, has the most powerful military. This gets a little bit more complicated and I'm trying not to get into international relations a bit and talking about, you know, how the United States has played such an outsides role, specific, outsides role, particularly after World War II um, in global affairs.
So specifically, then you can integrate another piece of evidence. So we describe one piece of evidence, but then try, you can also kind of, it's not as neat as name, describe, explain, right? You can kind of embed and tie these pieces of evidence together. And we could say that Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution makes the president commander in chief of the military and Historically, presidents have often been believed to have the power to repel sudden attacks. However, presidents have gradually claimed more and more power in the realm of Foreign and military relations because of emerging different threat dynamics and um, political considerations by the legislature. Specifically, we, when talking about threat, the global war on terror the executive branch has claimed over time hours to engage in to commit military forces in self-defense after the 9-11 terrorist attacks branch lawyers asserted that there were few constraints on a president in times of war and that a threat environment where terrorists can hop on a plane and use it as a missile against United States citizens American civilian and military targets. However, presidents have gradually claimed more and more power in the realm of foreign and military relations. Executive Mitchell's letters that there were few constraints on the president in times of war and that a threat environment where terrorists can hop on a plane, use it as a missile against American civilian and military targets. Requires less restrictive conditions ability to commit American forces overseas. You can also bring in the Federal 70. This line of thinking is in keeping with Federalist 70's vision of an executive that is unitary um, energy energetic and ultimately responsive to crises, right? So this, you don't have to get into the length of, unlike the Bush administration's thinking behind, um, you know, an evolving threat landscape in which I've already alluded to several times in this video that kind of articulate in the 2002 national security strategy, um, you know, asserting the president's right um, or the United States right to engage in 
uh, preemptive hostilities against countries um, that may not pose a threat currently, but can pose a threat further down the line. Yep. After the Maya. This line I think he's in keeping. So this line of thinking is in keeping with Federal 70's vision of the executive that's unitary, energetic, and ultimately responsive to crises. Um, um, and you can kind of integrate it in that way. Right, and then you can see how I describe this piece of evidence, right? I describe the essence of this piece of evidence, but then, uh, I'm sorry, description I'm highlighting in blue in this video. But then I explain the rationale and how this connects, but actually before, right? So I kind of give a lead up and then I explain how it connects, right? So you don't have to put it in like name, describe, explain order. And, you know, r good writing is oftentimes more artistic and in, in finding ways to connect pieces of information. But ultimately, I'm linking this piece of evidence. I did it before to the thesis statement. But then we're looking for other pieces of evidence as well. We discussed Article 2, and specifically we discussed a specific provision of Article 1. We discussed Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, specifically the Commander-in-Chief power, and we discussed and described what this entailed, and then its connection um, we made. Ultimately bringing back the evidence again to the thesis statement. Then you could put although, and again using the kind of yet while statements, there have been efforts by Congress to reclaim or I don't know how to spell rain in, is it? Rain in. Yeah. Rain in the president in although there have been efforts by Congress to reclaim or rein in the president in military. Although there have been efforts by Congress to rein in the president in military and foreign affairs, in the as the passing of the 1973 War Powers Resolution, President, although there have been efforts by Congress to rein in the president military and foreign affairs, such as the passing of 1973 War Powers Resolution, Congress has deferred increasingly to the president. And structurally, this makes sense, right? Because the president has under their um, you know, has information and easy access to executive branch agencies like the CIA and, you know, quality intelligence and, and is the commander in chief of the armed forces and regularly gets briefings. And so this deference is probably, you know, structural in some sense, in the sense that the president has access to more information, but this deference is also political. Uh, but first, you want to actually describe what the war power resolution is. resolution 
So here I describe what the war powers resolution is, and then I describe how presidents have kind of interpreted the war powers resolution as giving them a green light to conduct hostilities within 60 days. Long as it doesn't exceed 60 days. And so I can include an article about, you know, the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Um, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani by President Trump. It's giving them green light to conduct a facility as long as it doesn't exceed 60 days. And in more extreme cases, presidents have altogether ignored the war powers resolution because as limiting the, and these are the political reasons. Um, Congress first doesn't want to be seen as limiting the president's ability to keep America safe, right? Because oftentimes presidents and politicians try to drum up threats. Congress first doesn't want to be seen as limiting the president's ability to keep Americans safe by citing legal restrictions. Also, Congress has learned from has sought to make do not limit the president's war powers or conduct of hostilities or rein in. Congressmen, there's some that quite do want to limit the president's war powers. Congress has sought to not rein in the president's war powers as they worry that Congress may be held accountable for a war going bad or too long. All right, so there's an effort by Congressman to essentially pass the responsibility. And we talked about this in 2003. Um, a lot of politicians, you know, authorized the Iraq war, which was very popular in 2003. But then after the insurgency and, and, and a lot of complications in the conduct of the war, um, they faced, you know, a great deal of hostilities. Okay, sorry, I'm super tired, but I hope this essay helps. Oh, and then you also want to refute an alternative perspective, but I'm not going to do that. I've already done that. I'm tired. <laughs> 